in 2005, the National Assembly passed the Trafficking of Persons Act, prohibiting all forms of trafficking and prescribing sufficiently stringent penalties ranging from three years to life imprisonment. The penalties ought to be commensurate with other crimes such as rape. However, trafficking investigations, prosecutions and convictions have been rape, have been rare of two sex trafficking prosecutions initiated in previous years. One has remained pending and one was dismissed. The history associated with revelations by the media, critical comments and reviews mainly by the US State Department and stout denials by the government is about all we have had to go on. Two days ago, the women's organization Red Thread expressed satisfaction that the issue in trafficking in persons has finally, finally caught the attention of the National Assembly, even during a parliamentary budget debate. An organization that has been in the forefront of the fight against human trafficking, particularly in the mining sector, is again a women miners organization led by Simona Brooms and her Vice President, Eureka Primus. They are my guests on Plain Talk this evening, and I take pleasure in welcoming you, ladies. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ram. Thank you. Can you tell us what is the objective of your organization? Because it seems that you're performing a rather social, national, and important function. But what's the principal purpose for which you were formed? Well, uh, we launched onto the team expanding opportunity for women in the mining sector. But I can briefly share with you some of our obje objectives. We we'll deal with social issues that affects women in the mining sector. We look at health issues. We looked at um, trafficking. We look at child labor. These are all parts of our objectives. So some persons is of the belief that listen. This is a new thing now that the Women Miners Organization dealing with trafficking, I want to say no from the outset. It is part of our objective, definitely is. Ms. Primus, you've been with the organization for some time as well. Right? Yes. Okay. Now, um, you must have compared your objectives with the men's miners organization. Do they look at those important social issues? From what I know, not so far, no. Some things they might comment on, but it's not within their objective. So your involvement, in fact, is that it was always part of, of what you were supposed to do. Exactly. Why, looking, as, as, as Ms. Primer said, it, 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 your counterparts in the, um, in, in the, the male organization, they have not paid particular attention to this, as a, at least publicly. Is it that you saw um, a lacuna, a, a, a weakness, an absence in theirs that you decided, look, we're going to take on this issue? Yeah, for me, um, women in the mining sector was never paid a, um, a, any attention to, even from, from that administration level. Um, and I just want to touch a little wider. When we were launched last year, we are fighting to have a data set up. And it was said to us it is difficult because in order to do that, you have to go back to the application, look at the names, and then wonder if it is a male or a female. The forms is in no way, or the application, set up to say male or female. They probably assume they will so only male. They, 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 they probably assume because it's male dominated. We were never looked at. And being a minor for 27 years, all the things that is happening now, or we are exposing now, is a part of my everyday life. And I said at the uh, outset of the launching, it is because of my experience and passion that motivate me. The Guyana Women Miners Organization is a brainchild of mine. The logos that we have, the heading and everything, it's a brainchild of mine. I want you to understand that for all those years, it's a deep burden that I've been fetching. And 27 years, I don't think I could fetch it anymore. So that was the time for me to burst loose. Why did you come on, Ms. Primus? As a minor, and also as a young minor, I understand that women have not been paid attention to, and if the young women within mining do not stand with them, then we would be cast aside as well. It's, when one thinks of mining, you think of the adventurous 
tough, challenging environment. What what do women? You you, you say you're women miners. What do you tell 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 us tell the viewers? What do women and miners do? Ah, women miners. Some of them have their own property, and in the hundreds, it's not few women. In the hundreds, women have their own mining operations. Women have their own businesses in the, in the interior. Now it's a more demand for a female cook than a male cook in the mining sector. We the women out there, we have women in our organization and in the sector who jet, who marat, have those deep passions. As for me, I, I never You're using technical the, terms that uh, the viewers may have some difficulty with. Like like what? The jet and the... Well, the jet and the marak, um, for you it might be technical, but there's as least as I could break it down. Jetting means to say you find a man in a pit with a jet. It's like a fire truck with a yeah. horse and jetting the soil and, and all of that, doing the actual work in the pit. We have women in the sector um, that does the same things too. We have women that, that welds in, in the mining sector. We've got some great welders. I know from Bardico where I live, you know, we, we got one, two of the best female welders out in the sector going out in the interior. So we are there, you talk about being adventurous. Um, I was born and raised in Bardico. And um, you know, because you're much more older than I am, that it is said it's a gateway to the interior. All I ever want to do is mine. I want to have my own business. I want to be out there. I know but sinking in the falls, go through the rapid, running down the hills and all of that. It, it never scares me. Um, as a woman, and a lot of people expect to see a big, strong looking, you know what I mean? That's all I ever wanted to do is mine. I just love it. Do you share that same kind of passion? Yes, because I grew up in a family of miners. So then from a small age, she would take you into the interior, let you know what's going on, how everything works. So it's something in which you aspire to take over when you get older. Is it particularly more challenging, more difficult for a man than a woman? I think it's more challenging for a woman because there's high expectations. For a man, it's something in which they believe, in which they own. But for us, we have to fight to make it our own. Does the GGMC and the Guyana Gold and Diamond Miners Association, do they um, respect you, they accord you the, the same kind of um, level that Yes. They have. Are, are you represented, for example, on the board of the GGMC? No, well, we are not represented. Um, and we have a problem with that. Even early in this year, you might have read some of our articles because I'm saying, being in a sector which is male dominated, early in this year, um, when the boards was about to constitute again, I heard the minister talk about including the Amarinians and having the voice of the Amarinians, which is a great thing. And I said to him, but what happened to the voice of a woman? who really understands. So from the board point of view, and that is not the responsibility of the Commissioner again, the Geology of Mines, or it's not a call of the GDDME, um, I want to say that it is my belief that if it was their call, then we would have been a part of the board. But the call for the board is definitely um, for the minister and the cabinet, and, and they decide who and who um, needed to go to um, um, the Ghana Gold Board. There is no board no board that, that, that we are on. In fact, um, the minister said, listen, we will have you on the board as an invitee. You could observe and you could talk, but if it comes to changing policies and all of that, we can't have a vote. So I said, I find that to be an insult. You understand? It's not like we have all the time in the world to waste to go and sit down and have a nice lunch at a board meeting and just listen. You understand? So um, I think that that's a great insult for us. So from the board point of view, that uh, is a sore area that you touch there because it's really painful to me to know that um, no one is considering, you know, the woman on the board and for us to be represented. Ms. Prime Minister, uh, as Vice President of the organization, what, what do you plan doing? What does your organization plan doing to make the kind of strident advocacy that will produce the results where you, you, you're not um, invited just to sit there and listen, but you are a full member at the head table. I plan to assist the president and as well to mobilize the members 
to push for the way forward, to, to fight for us to actually be heard on the board, to change the policies in which affect us every day. How hopeful are you that this is going to happen soon? <laughs> Not too hopeful indeed, but it's, it's, it's one thing to accept it and it's another thing to fight for the change. If you accept it, then it will never happen. If you continue to fight, then we stand a greater chance of having it. I want to digress for a moment on an issue that has become quite significant and topical, not that it's trafficking, and that is the gold price. Um, you heard conversations, for example, um, the president was, was being asked about it, what we should do. Apparently, the Guyana Gold Board has a substantial stock of gold that it bought at around $1,800, maybe. Um, the market is ab around $1,450, so it's quite a substantial um, loss in whatever way you look at it. How should the government, in your view, deal with this? Well, for me, I was expecting to see government first trying to assist the small and medium scale miners, because, and all the miners, we suffer greatly um, at the loss uh, in the gold price because you can't go to the workers now and say, listen, we're gonna change your wages because gold price dropped and um, we can't afford to pay you this and we can't afford to pay you that. And then we have to pay the same transportation. I beg to remind you that the only duty free that we get is an ATV bike and we have to pay VAT on that. Um, when we go there, everything we have to pay a VAT on it. So I was looking to see um, the government. I have a friend who had a big crash with his vehicle and all of that and said to me, you know, I really need some help with the gold price and all of that. I have to go and I want to mortgage my home for $2 million just to start up or, or to start back. I think that is something that the government should put in place because anytime there's a crisis with rice and sugar and all of that, government always seems to step in with financial support. And I think at this level, minus some minus should be considered to have some kind of financial support to remain in the sector. I think this is a great time for government to come with a compensation of duty free, even if it's a single cab vehicle that will ease some of the, the cost in terms of rental of transportation and, and things like that, that will bring some kind of ease or relief to the small and the medium scale miner to have them there. Um, I witnessed a move there that um, was recently made. Now the minister, if let us say, for example, let me break it up for you, you you're a Guyanese and you have a large scale concession. All right, you would have gotten duty free and all kind of thing with that truck and pick up whatever it comes with. And now you, because of the gold price, you are able to convert that large scale concession into medium scale blocks and to do alluvial mining just like me. Mm -hmm. But I beg to remind you that you have already gained from the large scale in terms of, of the duty free. I have no quarrel of what you receive, but I'm saying it should be brought across the board because just as how Mr. Ram get all the duty free and all of that, now we can come back and do the alluvial mining what provision is there to bring a step-up system, you know, from the poke knocker to five inch to six inch to, to, to the medium scale minus. So the gold price really um, is taking a great toll. You notice the lottery, for example, in Masruni and in Kayuni, you had 500 and something lots. And you only had 100 and something applications. So everybody who had an application won a, a, a piece of land. And, and that is because of the same thing, the interest. And then persons are saying that, listen, even if you win this property, there's no, um, some of the places you have no access, there's no road, it is difficult. Um, persons think that with a gold price drop like this, the, 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 the plots that should have been available should have been more attractive in terms of, of mineral. We feel that they should have selected a better or more mineralized area that has gold that will attract the small and medium scale miners to said, okay, let me go after this piece of area here. You understand, but I've talked to lots of miners. I try to influence some of them into getting involved um, into the lottery. And that is exactly what they had to say. So it is taking a big impact with us. I mean, from a government standpoint, 
um, we know all that the gold price will go up again. Maybe they could they how could soon? be able. Yeah, but, but, well, but how soon? Well, I'm saying if not how soon, our country um, have what it takes to get loans and all of that to stockpile this gold, and that in itself is collateral, and have money to continue to do their businesses. You understand, we as, as the miners out there, um, we don't have that. We can't get a loan from the bank unless we got our own houses and all of that. I read about how many money bank give the miners. We have, you must have, they don't hold an excavator as a collateral. You understand, you got to put up your property and all of that. So for them, um, I think that I, I, I understand from a country standpoint, I don't think it's a lost situation because I think that we have what it takes and should have mechanism in place to deal with things like the, the, the gold price if it goes down and how they're going to stockpile the gold and all of that because it's not by a fly-by-night business. It happens all the time. From, but what provision is there to assist the small and medium scale miners who definitely will be affected because we are miners. The large scale miners, they of course, is at a different level. They're not doing alluvial mining or should not be doing. Mm -hmm. While now, provision is made that they can even, with all the benefits to it, do alluvial mining like us. I'm saying that I don't think that we have been considered at all. It, it, that's a big issue by itself. Ms. Prime Minister, President is suggesting that not only are women prejudiced um, in the gold mining sector by virtue of being women, but by virtue of the fact that they tend not to be the large scale operators, they also are disadvantaged. Is that the correct situation? Um, but before, before I allow Ms. Prime Minister to, to answer, um, we have two large scale owners in this country that are females. Mm -hmm. uh, against how many ma males? <laughs> well, well that's what I mean. So the majority. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to play it out before one will say that Ms. Bisbee only, is, you know what I mean, it's too alone and that, that's factual. Yes, I think so because in many instances, we've been called to represent small and medium scale miners because the large ones, the large scale miners would have more benefits in which they do. So one, you have to fight because you're in a small scale of mining. And two, you have to fight because you are a woman. This issue um, of gold, and, and, and we see it in rice, we see it in every area. When things are going good, you never hear any complaint. You never hear, oh, and we must do this. There is a view that for every two ounces of gold that is produced in Guyana by whichever miner, medium, large scale, woman, man, one ounce does not get reported. Is that a fair estimate? Well, um, I wouldn't say it's fair, and I don't think sometimes it's a default of the miner. And that is why I say that um, these things is not because... Whose fault can it be if, if there's um, because on if, a declaration? Because if Mr. Ram has a license to buy my gold, and I'm in Madhya, and I'm at Port Kaituma, mm -hmm. and I sell that gold to Mr. Ram, uh -huh. and then in the next two, three, four, five months, one year, I'm going to go to the Guiana Gold Board to have my declaration of gold sold. Mm -hmm. And the gold board is going to say to me, we have no records yeah. that, 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 that this gold was was sold you didn't sell any gold yes i sold my gold i sold my gold to mr ram mr ram has a license okay then we'll get back to you and which never it. happened and, th and that's it so all the accusation is against the miner. miners as if we, we are so bad what can we do with the other ounce of gold what can we do with it? We export need the it. money. We can't Ex export the ounce of gold. You could, no, no, you can export it. You could sell it to be, and you, you can sell it to people who export. So the suggestion then, it's often the, the part of the on the declaration is because of the middle men, yes, rather than middle women. We don't have middle women in this, is it? We don't have middle women that I know of. <laughs> now, as we're on that topic, and we'll get back to trafficking in persons. Um, give me your views. On that ten million dollars of gold, U.S. dollars of gold, exported through Curacao and then disappearing into thin air. Well, we had no view on it because all we learned about the gold was via media. 
All we ever know is that I read in the newspaper that X amount of gold and this and that, and there was some kind of rumbling with it. We don't know any facts. We was not given anything. We, um, from the organization standpoint, need from an individual where they have any meeting and this is what was said and this is the evidence. This is where the gold came from, who gold it was, and things like that. So, like everyone else, it, it was just something that was read by an immediate. So we could not. I wouldn't have a view. The organization did not pronounce. But we but but, no but uh, among yourselves, I mean, you you have a sorority, a, a community of women miners, a community of miners. Mm -hmm. They must be talking. Who's everybody can be talking? What is the but problem? What, and what, 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 do, is? what do you get as the? What's the sense of what in fact happened there? Unless we get the truth. We don't know it's a fact. It will always be a speculation. It's just from another country, some goal, hitting a wrong by a hit and miss, as it was reported, and, and, and that's about it. We have no factual position on it or nothing that we could we could comment, even in a discussion like you talk. Girl, I read in the paper, it's the most you I read the same thing too. You understand? And and this as far as it goes. <laughs> Ms. Brooms, I'm sure the conversation goes beyond that. No, but that's the conversation all right. didn't go there. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Do you believe the GGMC and the Guyana Gold Board do a good job in supervising and policing the sector? <laughs> Mr. Ram, let us stick to traffic here. No, you <laughs> I, not, you're never a woman to, to run, run from No, no, from no. I, I, I think much more needs to be done. Um, we sit down at the SLUC, and that is why I'm trying to, you know, I'm not running from it. We sat down at the SLUC, the Special That's Land the Use, use committee, committee. Yes. That was headed by Minister Ben and had all the stakeholders sit down, talk about all these things and what needs to be done and all of that. And I didn't see anything was being implemented or you take out this and this is being done and that is being done. You understand? Just a few weeks ago, we've had a meeting with Minister Robert and I shared some views again. You understand? So everybody know what is the problem. But your question, let me answer it very frankly. If I think that a good job is being done in that area, I will say from my point of view, no, straight off the book. Is that, would, would that be the organizational position, um, Ms. Primus? I think it's better if you get the organizational position from the president. <laughs> <laughs> in cricket, you call it batting in your crease. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, you've asked me to, uh, let's return to our <laughs> principal topic this morning. The hinterland areas, could probably worse than the Wild West in the old days because you have more sophisticated weaponry. Um, you probably have few people to protect anybody's rights, etc. Why do you all take such risks challenging persons, even, even officials? Why do women do that? Why do you do that? Um, it, it's my passion. It is something as a woman, like I said, it has been happening all the time. And let me tell you something, Mr. Ram. This is something I did not start only from the organization, you know. I'm always out there as a single woman fighting and raising these issues. And I want to share this with you this morning. Many years ago, when the U.S., because you read about U.S., brought out a report on trafficking in person, there's a minister that called me and said, you know, Mistress Brooms, I want to ask the Minister of Human Services, which is not the minister now, but mm -hmm. previously, um, maybe you could talk and share some of your views and your ideas, knowing that you would always talk about these issues and all of that. So he said to me, um, we need some help just to get clarity. And I said, right away. He said, I gave the minister your number, and um, she was going to call you, just asking for your support. I said, no problem. Um, so a few days after, he called me back. He said, you get a call from the minister. I said, no. He said, did you call her? I said, no. I thought you said that she, she needs some her. help and that she will call me. So if she calls me, I'm right here. But lo and behold, she never called. The reason why I mentioned that. Ne and never since then? And never since then. Wow. The reason why I mentioned that. When I talk about anything, I'm very factual. This is not something that Mistress Brooms is getting into now because for whatever people talking, 
some people in some people in authority that you want fame. I don't want fame. Newspaper could make me famous. You understand? I'm about people. This is something that I'm seeing, looking at, and know that nothing is not being done. And don't tell me it is not reported. Don't tell me it is not known. I know it is known. But as a Guyanese, as a woman, who is going to stand up? Who is going to stand up? I was waiting for somebody to cry out. I was waiting maybe for some male in some different organization or somebody. I was waiting on the government, on the administration to say, listen, we have these women out there and this is what's happening and that's what's happening and all kind of thing. Nobody, I used to go to the prime minister's office and I'm happy to mention he never refused to see me. I would stand up all by the door downstairs to cry, to go and complain some exploitation and what we, even if I ain't get no, 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 no answer to the end of the day. Just to ensure that they know the pain that we feel as women. I was one of the women who did it alone. So trafficking in person is not something now. And, 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 and somebody um, talk of stupidness and you will always find those in authority when they feel like they're being shocked. Oh, you know, we got to start looking at Miss Blooms because like, she's a spy for us. Life from hell. When we write and share our objectives with Canada, with US, with government and our constitution widely. We had a meeting with the High Commissioner of Canada. We talk about training for women and this for women and all of that. And he said, listen, you're pushing an open door. We embrace you as women. I understand your concern. And he had his advice to give. We met with the US on the same note. And they invited us, wanted to know if we understand what is it we're talking about. And when I talk about trafficking in person, I, I didn't know it is so sensitive. And then the USA clearly asked me, you know about the law, you ever been to any workshop or anything about trafficking? And I said no. And they said, okay, since you're NGO and you're young and you have this passion as a part of your objective, let us share with you some little flyers about trafficking and start to educate us about the law. Because he said that they said it's important that we know the law about trafficking. They, they, they had these round tables invited us where human services were there where um the police was there where the judge was there and all of that after they have realized that it's a part of our objectives and that is how how, how us um we we had a talk so nobody in spite we have sent letters to the government and all of it nobody said let us educate you in fact persons accused me and said listen you know we're talking about trafficking in person and i asked one question you want me to define it in the public media you want to define it now? You understand? <laughs> no, well, I Here's your opportunity, Ms. Brooks. <laughs> well, like, as we go along, because you said it, we'll talk more about it. You understand? Well, what is trafficking in person? Well, trafficking in person, um, from the little that I've learned, is that the Guyana, in Guyana, there's a law that once a person is below the age of 18 and is used even in a hotel, to for um, purposes um, of cash and gain, gain, and they're under the age. Even if it is in a hotel room in a big city, and somebody takes this young girl into a room, or let us say a young boy, and then you have somebody, the pimp collecting this money, and then this person going there and sex, you give them the money, that is trafficking. If the person is over the age of 18, and let us talk like what happened in the interior, that there were two girls there that said they were over 18. This is the most recent and this is the most incident sensitive. you're talking about. Yes. And one of them said, listen, I've listened to you because I explained when I got to the shop. She said, I listened to you and I'm over 18, but I want to leave. I want to leave so long. I'm here for a month. Could you help me? And I said, yes, because you're not supposed to be held against your will. You understand, you're, you're able to leave once you're, once you're being held against your will and you want to leave, then definitely I have no objection in taking you out. You understand? So little by little as we understand, we go out there and educate. I went to the shop educating and talking to the proprietor about trafficking. Uh, are you aware of the, the recent incident in which um, Ms. Brooms was involved? Yes, I wasn't there, but I was informed after. That was quite a, it must have been quite a dangerous a frightening moment, was it? Indeed. Tell us about it. You want me to tell you? Yes. <laughs> That's well, why you came here this morning. <laughs> well, it is dangerous. 
um, I want to say right off the back foot. Um, but to put you in my position, even if you're a male, and you're going on a journey, and you know everything that is taking place in this interior. You know what happens. And you stop to my shop and said, you know, Mrs. Brooms, good afternoon. We're here, we, we have a barbecue, and we want to use this opportunity to talk about trafficking in person. And um, I ask, how many girls are there? We are there. Bring them and let us, I want them to hear me also. Because we don't only want to educate the proprietor, but the persons are on that on the shop and all of that. And I began to tell them about trafficking and they're not supposed to be held against their will and all of that. And you see a little girl in your eyes, all waggle, wagging her legs like this. You know, like you get nervous instantly, sh shaking, uncontrollable shaking. And then you just look up and said, the proprietor said, everybody here is adults, they're over 18. And I said, it's a fast answer. And I look and say, how old are you, girl? And you saying to me, 17 and blink. You not tell me age and blink. Remember, I'm looking for the signs from you. Mm -hmm. Because I was saying to my ladies when we stop, you look at the languages, look to see if you see a paper thrown, look to see if somebody writes in the sun. There was a girl I went in an area in Conrook and she wrote on the sun a telephone number. You understand, on the sun. Wow. So I'm saying that, listen, you're going to look for every sign, look at the body language and all of that. While I'm talking, if anybody is trying to get your attention, pay attention. I'm educating the group before, the team that will go out. So immediately after she blinked and the one waggling uncontrollably, I said, excuse me, can I talk to the two of you for a minute? And um, you put you in my position now, because it's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. And the child snatched onto you and said, oh, Mr. Ram, you don't carry me, please. I was only 14 years. And I went to the next shop and they take me on my money and I ain't got no money and I'm glad to go home. And next one says, only last night I had prayed and asked God, who can take me out of this situation? And he got one inside the kitchen and she's only 40, Miss Lady, and she died and all of you want to go, more we can go. And the lady be frightened she because she beat up a girl and the girl go down and she go to police and GGMC and nobody ain't come up to now. So nothing ain't happening. Miss Lady, you don't care, we can tell you the truth. This is the age and everything. And I said, okay, so where are you living? And I can show you after the show on my phone. I said, where are you living? We're sleeping and all of that. And when you go, you see these girls like animal, two pieces of board, but six inches wide one. And two of them have to share that room. And I said, the two of you sleep right here? She said, yes. I said, so how you say you're doing business, you're prostituting and giving the shop lady all this money. Where does that take place? I said, right here. And if she get a gentleman one sec, she, I just go outside the way. I said, for you falling. So we gotta go and wait outside. And when she finishes, somebody want to go in there with me, then that's how we can share the room. So I said, how much time at night? Well, she said that, you know, if we only the men come and we say we want to do business, the proprietor can come and they say next day they can't relax. They can abuse and cuss and abuse them all the time. So it means to say, what will you do? Because it's a risky situation. So put, I want to put it to you now as a man, much just me a mother and who have kids. What are you going to do? Are you going to say to these girls, listen, y'all bear up here, little. I can go and I can see and call and see if I can get some help, and then I can come back to you, and I can come back. But Miss Lady, if you left me here, like how y'all come here, it's mm -hmm. gone, it's more problem, you don't leave me here. And I look into the other females on my team to give her eye to say, well, yeah. where's the move? We in it or out it? And my mom members say, listen, pack up, we, we going. You understand what I mean? We need together. So the lady said, listen, Madam President, we need together. They need help and we don't care what is it. So I say, I gotta watch me back, see who coming from the right, from the left. You understand what I mean? Because at the time the meal wasn't there. So the girls pack up their clothes and I asked the proprietor, so where the money, the, the gold and so on that the girls give to you? She said, well, um, they gonna wait if they want it because she got to wait on the man to collect it. So, in my mind, I wanted she wanted us to buy them. I said, all right, good. The time will come that you will have to pay them. All I want to do is to take these okay. girls out from the situation that I'm seeing them in. So at that spur of the moment, another point at the time, if I had to do it again, Mr. Ram, to put myself at risk, I'm going to do it again. It's not, 
it's not an easy thing. It is not something that somebody will just will and you think I just want to will and jump into something for my shoot me. You don't want to be a martyr, dead. yeah. But I, I would not leave them like that. Tell me something. Um, how many incidents like those, not, not with your involvement, how, ma how many cases of child prostitution and child tra children trafficking is taking place in the mining sector alone? Your, your, your reasonable estimate, we know it exists in forestry, we know it exists in other on the coast. types, it exists in, on the coast, you've got um, child prostitution, even in households, you've got that kind of thing, the country girl, the person from the interior comes and works with a family, and it's, it's not much different, well, perhaps not as bad. In the mining sector, how bad is it? If you had to put a number. You know, because because of my experience and my passion, I wouldn't want to put a number to it. You know, you're putting <laughs> questions to me. <laughs> and when I put questions to, to you, you. Right. But you see, I like that because you're the boss here, right? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but I, I don't want to put a number. I like to be very factual. I'm going to quote myself here. I said it before to the media. We are going to go out there, we're going to, get, we're going to do our job, we're going to stick to our objectives, and we will leave that, we will decide that to you. What we will declare will be the facts. Mr. Ram, the situation with trafficking in the interior is a big money business, and it's an easy, easy way to make money. All right, let me, let me ask you a different question. You will stick to the facts. Based on your own experiences, how many cases, how many children? I can't count them. Like how many? I mean, 50, 75, 100, 200? Like enough. 90? You'd say? If we say out of 100, or if we said 10, out of 10, I would say 9. Mm -hmm. still, a, still have an evasive answer, but that's all right. <laughs> The United States, and, and you mentioned that you've met with the United States, you've even been, you say you've been accused yeah. of, of, of being a spy, an, a spy yes. of the United States. Um, they have, in successive reports, said that the government of Guyana has not been doing enough to address this question of trafficking in persons. Do you share that? I support that. I support that. I support that from, from every being in me, from what I could see. If you're supporting trafficking in person, and I like to use the presence as an example. Thank you. And there's me talking to you and telling you about me taking a big gamble upon the judgment of a situation that is before me. And I went and I contacted, listen who I contacted. I contacted the commander of F Division. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I contacted the Minister of Natural Resources and Environment. I so this is recent then? This is recent. As soon as, I, as soon as I picked these girls up, mm -hmm. I went to communication, get a satellite phone and call immediately. Immediately. I called Human Services, the 623 hotline. No response to that. You talk about a task force. You called the minister, did you, what was the response? I called the hotline for the humans. No, no response to that. Um, there's you a guy the by commander. the name. You called the commander. Yes, I got him. I got Minister Passad. We talked. I told him. Um, I called Clement. He this is said Minister Rohi? No, the one of somebody that works with him on the task force that mm -hmm. shared his number. His phone went straight to voicemail. All right? Um, so, who else do I call here? I ain't get them. Who am I thinking? I'm thinking that there's a guy named Michael Fraser from the U.S. who had shared a number and said, "Listen, if sometime you're in a situation and you want, you have communication, you could call and we could see how we could assist you also." So I called Michael Fraser from the U.S. and we left. And I said, "As soon as I get signal again, I'm going to make contact with you." And these are the persons that I spoke with. I want you to point out to me, and I want the general public to understand when we talk about enough being done or what is being done to assist these victims of trafficking in person. So we get to the police checkpoint again coming out 
And I stopped and said, listen, police said all was well. I said, no, we have a problem. We head into the Barnica police station. We got four girls here, suspected case of trafficking in person. He said, give me the right information. I gave it to him. Head to the pontoon, signal again with my cell phone. So I called the minister because by that Which time, minister, again? minister Robert Bassad again, because I'm going back through the protocol, you know. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the persons, the proprietors for the shop at the time, trailed us, come directly in front of our vehicle and stop like this. So the guy came out and the girl, she come to my door. Mm -hmm. But he come in with all the accusing and threats and all that, but she to the other side, but how we could work out something. I know what language he talked about, work out something. Okay, yeah, know you know what I mean? So I know which time I'm work on something. <laughs> this is not a running, this is not a, the normal system she ought to understand. Because the Ghana Women Miners Organization, we stand clear of many things. So we, I can speak the truth. And I called and rushed to the pontoon, called the commando. Commando, I'm here to the body, and there's the persons again come with the threats and this and that and that and that. All right, called Bartica Police Station, and he said, I will call Bartica Police Station also. I call minister, minister listen, we're here and this and that. Minister, sorry. Must make sure you give me a report in the morning and I can get on top of it. Call Clement, Clement phone turn off. Call human services in, get them. Call back Michael Fraser. Where are you now? I said, this is it. She so said, oh yes, all right. Let me see who I could get and, and call you back. She so called back. Mrs. Brooms, where are the girls? Everybody stay at the pontoon. I said, well, we left the vehicle and we are on the journey and so on. He said, I tried to call Clement, but I am not getting any response. But um, I get on to Tricia Watson Human Services and um, I told her and, and things like that. So we're in the middle of the river on the pontoon. Every five to ten minutes, the phone rings. The only buddy I see recalling me back here now is Michael Fraser. Mrs. Brooms, where are you? How far are you at from the police station? Because he don't understand the, the location mm -hmm. and things like that. So... I call Tricia, call back Human Services, and I get to Tricia. The phone ring, and I hear, hello, good night. I'm saying, good night, can I speak to Kesta? Because there's a number that I got that was shared to me, but I know a guy by the name of Kesta works there. But after nobody said, hello, good night, Human Services hotline, and all that, I want to know if it's the wrong number. So I'm saying, hello, good night, can I speak to Kesta? Kesta's not there. Uh, could you tell me when he'll be back? I don't know. Um, can I leave a message for him? Yes, you can. Okay. Just tell Mrs. Bloom's called. I have four cases suspected in trafficking a person. How, have they got back to you since then? Oh, um, human services. Human services? Yes. And that was after. I, I mean, in fact, I called the minister um, and she was not here. And the truth be known, she's really upset um, about the whole thing because so she was surprised that it must be dealt this way. All right, let me, let me ask you this. Have the man and the woman been arrested? No. I gone to the police now, Mr. Ram, because I can reach back, you know. I tell the police, listen, this is what happened, and right now, the pontoon leave these persons at Itabali with the vehicle. The vehicle cannot move without the pontoon. Understand my language clearly, because mm -hmm. for the viewers who don't understand. And from Itabali, there's a police checkpoint about five minutes drive, 10 to five minutes, not far from Itabali, and there we have the Bartica police station. So I would expect, even if the police don't want to go in the night, or they want to send somebody from the checkpoint to the vehicle at Itabali, the first crossing in the morning, the vehicle got to come on. So I expect the police to go, go there now. I find out from them, yeah, I'm going to go check the pontoon, give them everything. Because we got the vehicle number and all of that. Go back to the station, the police. When I got there about 10, 10 o'clock again, because we went before, come back nine and go back. I asked the police that I spoke to the night. I said, um, it's going to tell me if anything about the, the, the persons. No, I passed by the house this morning and I see nobody there. Eh? No, but you check the pontoon, no, inform Sharima because if you pass there, you got to pass Sharima. And then when I called the command again and gone to the OC, the OC telling me, oh, I saw you last night, but um, I didn't even know that you was assaulted or anything. Um, nobody reported to me. I said, but you saw me in the block so, out. So, so, so these persons, despite everybody knowing by now, mm -hmm. these persons have not been arrested. They have not been taken into custody and questioned for their role in trafficking in persons. No, 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 not that I know. No. No. How then, how then do you respond to the regular government's reaction 
which is to denounce U.S. reports as unfounded claims and anecdotes that are so replete in these reports, in the U.S. reports. That's, that's all the U.S. reports are all about, is, is anecdotes. Mm -hmm. Stories we pick up here and stories we pick up there. How do you react to the government's response? Well, I think by now the, the government will take a check. Why? A check. Because this is not here in their story now. This is reality. Hmm? And these are a real situation, and I'm a real person. I'm not no matrix woman sitting here this morning. But you've been real from the, from from the, the time you started talking ago. about exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. And like you said, it, it was mentioned in the parliament. So who are going to deny this now? And what I like about this, Mr. Ram, is the level of awareness while person accused me of going to the media. Because people in Guyana now calling me, Mrs. Brooms, I, I saw this thing in movie. I didn't know this thing is real. But you know, just now when I ask you about numbers, and I really wanted to get from you, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> accountants would call that a little bit of fudging. Yeah. With, uh, uh, because it's one thing for them to now say, yes, we know it has happened. Mm -hmm. But that's a nice, so they move mm -hmm. from saying it's purely anecdotal. Mm -hmm. It is, um, I think it is misrepresentation and scaremongering leading to a waste of resources and energy. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the police shouldn't be um, following up these matters. It's, it's a waste of resources and energy. energy. Now, this is why I need it from you. I need it from both of you. Um, Some numbers. But you see, I, the I, only An thing idea of numbers, how, how frequent is this? This is very frequent, but the only thing is why I like to be very factual, Mr. Ram. You know the country I live in. You understand, you're older than I. And then tomorrow, oh, next story, what Miss Brooms, write down on a paper and where an if and button maybe. So I start writing. So but the next year now, before this year, then, you know, you and I can meet on this program. And I'll I'm going to that, tell then. you numbers that we've got to talk about. Because again, they can go back to say, you know, um, the women minors and the excited and um, dramatic. Um, well, uh, dramatic rescue. You, use the word rescue. You, you understand, and um, you can't use the word rescue well, I, I, right now. I don't now. think that could be said of Miss Prime Minister. But at listen, all. <laughs> but listen, Mr. Ram. What about you talk about misuse of funds? You know what the police said. Maybe they didn't go for the girl before that. We won't beat and swell up and all of that. Because they're not transportation. They had transportation. That's what the police said. Yeah. Yes. And GGMC, I know if they even call GGMC to get a vehicle available because Mr. Rick Ford was the commissioner. I want to say to you, he, he really embraced us and the whole thing with trafficking, I, I think as a father and as a man, I really respect him for that. We called, we had a matter to go and rescue two females. And I called Mr. Rick Ford the afternoon about 4.30, which was a Friday. And the next morning by 5 o'clock, a vehicle was ready and waiting to take us to the location and bring us back. Now, and this is a program we try to be as factual and, and blunt as possible. Do you think the Amerindian community, including the Amerindian ministers, has done enough in protecting the young Amerindian is, mainly women, but I, I think you have it in the employment practices in the forestry sector. Do you think they've done enough to protect their own? I don't think so. I think um, what sometimes we lack of in this country, and one would say, um, you know, is the culture. Mm -hmm. When I went to let him. So if we have a culture of prostitution and thieving, uh, you know, and this, you must know, this is a culture you could hold on to that. When I went to let him, a surprising word that the chairman said to me, who's an Amerindian, he said to me, you know what, Mrs. Brooms, I welcome you. And I welcome you in these communities to educate our people. He said, lots of them they don't see what you're saying from the point of view that you're bringing. And I have a lot of Amerindian members. I've had some of them come out with deep passion from 58 Mile. And said, listen, we want to join this whole, they're part of the organization, financial members. And they want to be a part of the unit, the trafficking in person unit. You understand, I have members from as far as Kamran, and these ladies now with a new passion and all of that. So what is happening here? That through the organization, a kind of awareness that the Armenians now of themselves from the community standpoint, they are now grabbing hold of it and want to be more watchful and not to 
because they were being condoned, is it something that they said with child labor and trafficking? Oh, you know, it's a culture, you know, in the Amerindian communities. Does the Guyana Women Miners Organization allow for honorary members? Yes, you who, can are, be. who are not in mining? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we have male associate miners members. <laughs> 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 I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> now, you mentioned um, the acting head of the GGMC, yeah. Mr. Rickford Vera. Mm -hmm. um, does that concern that empathy for, for, for trafficking? Does it run through the organization? Because I have read that there is complicity between some of the persons practicing this, this crime and, and officials. Yeah. including mining officers yeah. and forestry officers. Yes. Yeah. I agree, but um, to some extent, um, you have the manager of mines, Mr. Bob. Um, I think that he, he shared those sense. So what we try to do, we try to work with, with them to ensure, and that is why when we on ground, if we recognize or we identify, because they're in office sometimes, they would not always know. We give them the kind of feedback and things like that. And uh, we're happy to know that we don't only give the feedback, but they of themselves will call us back, the commission will call back and say, listen, this is what was being done, we investigated and, and things like that. So I think it is a good starting point, you know, to have persons to the top there at least that will want to see more and want to, to work with us and in the industry and everybody, because our organization, we work with government, non-governmental, non-political, international organization. It's a part of our constitution. There's also a view, certainly in the area of prostitution, that big ones, leading members of various professions, leading members of the police force, etc., might themselves be part of the process. They, they, they frequent some of these places. Is that part of your experience? Well, yes, uh, like you said before me, Mr. Ram, we live here in Guyana, you know, like you say, everything is a culture. You understand? So, we, I want to tell you that we even have in our organization, on our, on our tip, little unit in this organization, we even have um, a lady who speaks English and, um, and Portuguese. And we have um, her, we want her to do Spanish because she understands a little bit about that too. So that not only when we go there, and I think it's very important. So I think uh, the Brazilians also, we need to put them on notice that not only when we <coughs> go there, the Guyanese and who are on the age and all these kind of things, but widely, regardless if you're from Brazil, you're from Venezuela, you're from Haiti, wherever you're from, the law remains the law here. You understand? How do we, uh, before I, I ask that question, the question of how the victims are, are sometimes treated as though they are the criminals in the, um, in the prostitution business, the sex trade. Um, we see the, the, these juvenile women brought into the courts, treated as though they're criminals and ex deported right away. And then what happened to the other persons now? that would have employed them or, or have them. Well, I'm them. asking you. Right. We, we have a problem with that. Um, yes, since last year, we've had some matters with trafficking in person in court. And um, one of the girls, she already is not even going back. And the others, they're very frustrated because you go there and when they go there, you go in the witness box, you come out, you got to go back to be cross-examined. We got a member from our organization heading to Barbie sometime when she me telling George I'm going up. Then she get receive a phone call that, listen, um, the matter postponed and or the policeman not is not available and, and all these kind of things. Another thing with the victims, like the last matter there, we try to get a cell phone or something to make contact with them. They are not allowed to use a cell phone. They are not allowed to contact person. For heaven's sake, Mr. Ram, they are not prisoners. They are victims. Why would you take away their rights to a phone call? You understand? I need. I, I think all these things need to be re-examined. I am saying they should have a cell phone, at least, even if it is supervised or something. 
because Guyana is small. Don't tell me anything that they don't have a phone because of um, um, uh, protection. Don't tell me that. Everybody know where these girls are at. These girls is not, they even got a special built home. So everybody would know Guyana is a small place, a big place with few people. So I don't like the idea of them being treated as if they're criminal. You telling me you come out the bush and the only place you could keep me because of security is to sit up on a station bench or put a card board and light up on the ground. Without getting a cup of tea, wake up next morning to catch a speed, both a can brush my teeth. This is not a criticism. You obviously feel passionately Definitely. about this matter. But does that cloud your objectivity? No. Is it, no. I, I'm asking someone else. Because do you I'm think, speaking do you think our objectivity is clouded? No, I think it will motivate you to do more. How do we fix this problem? We, we know we've got a problem with the failure to investigate, prosecute, um, and follow up. We've got a problem with the regulators, we've got a problem with the police, we've got a problem with the legal system. What incentive is there, what mechanism is there in the law and in the society to stamp out trafficking in persons? I think you should ask it the other way. What mechanism is in place or what we should suggest be okay. put in place? Because I myself don't know um, um, what is in place. Are you? Because are you if I hear that, excuse me, if something is in place, but then when we got a matter to deal with, I don't know what is in place. Are you happy with the operation of the Trafficking Persons Act? No, I think combating the trafficking. Combating persons. the trafficking. No, I think we got to implement more. What would you? We've got um, we've got a couple minutes, Jeff, two to three minutes. What would you? recommend be done to reduce this to its absolute minimum you probably will never be able to stamp it out because it even happens in families you appreciate that yeah. and as you said the cultural thing takes some time yeah. to eradicate what do we do i think that um the bail sometime is how it is set because the first case we had i think it was two or three hundred thousand dollar bail the the, the the person i think that how much ounces the gold is? Less not an ounce. At the point it was, it was less, time, than less than an ounce. Less than an ounce. Little over half ounce of gold was mm -hmm. the bail. I think um, that is one of the, the things that we need to look at. I think if we have a better process of how we prosecute, a faster process, and persons should be sent to prison. And I think once you start to deal with it in that, in that angle, you send a stronger message, a stronger signal. Because if I could go to court, I could afford to go to court. The other day there was another one and pay 700000 I could afford to go to court and pay a million dollars. Because the money alone that I will get from some of these victims that I buy house and got put on in a bank, I could afford to pay that. So we got to first, I would want to suggest, have it to feel a listen. All I got to do is got some money prepared to get a lawyer and go to the court and get bail. Because it's gonna take two, three, four years and then the girl get frustrated and ain't got no evidence and I said scotch free. How do you deal with the, these weak regulators or maybe the complicit regulators? Whether we're talking about the PGMC officers, the gold board officers, the forestry officers, the police, how do you deal with those? Well, you mentioned earlier and Karen D'Souza pointed out in an article it is raised in Parliament. So I think now it is time that we go back and like Mr. Granger talk about, looking at this as a national problem and have all the stakeholders now come back to the table from a national level to say, listen, this is how we're gonna go about it and not just because it is an immediate for this whole week and everybody high and excited and looking to see what America will say, but to really see there's a problem in our country and from a national standpoint, because the opposition, they have, they have a voice now in Parliament in terms of legislation and all of that. So I hope that they will use that. I heard, uh, I didn't see it that Kathy, you would make mention of it and all that. So you're suggesting that the Combating the Trafficking in Persons Legis Act be amended? Definitely. Now, I, I know that we know the government has always rejected reports by the United States. In fact, this morning we read President Donald Ramatar 
telling the US, clean your house first, don't lecture us. Do you see the government taking the same kind of approach to the next report that involves um, comments on trafficking? Well, you know, like you say, I don't really run. I want to see when it come, what will they say? You understand? I don't have any expectation of them accepting it or admitting to what is happening. And um, I would not be surprised to see the same heading, that they need to clean their own houses first. What do you expect from your male counterparts? And um, if I can bring you in, Ms. Travis, what do you expect from your male counterparts, the GGGMA, on, the, on this issue that has become such a public issue now? <laughs> I can say something first. Yes, by all means. Good. I would love to see them um, collaborating with us in this effort. I know what you would love to. to. I'm, I'm asking what you would expect. I expect Anything? That. Nothing? Yes, I expect more. I want them to stand with us and to raise that, that voice. I hope to see them standing really strong. I was hoping we have a press conference together um, to have their views. We're going to meet with them very shortly um, to have their views and, 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 and really raise some of the things that we have deep concern and how they could really strengthen what we're doing. You've got support from the women's organization, Red Thread. Yes. yes. Do you expect, what do you expect from the wider society? I expect the wider society to, to join us in the fight. Oh, I mean, we're not, we're not funded. We're not funded, and let me make it very clear before we wrap up, Mr. Ram. Every cent that I earn goes right back, and I have some strong women out there. We have some strong women, not just got money, but make sacrifice to come down this fight. So the other NGOs that we're calling upon, um, I expect them to join us now that we have any cash to give her, but see how they themselves and Guyanese themselves could make the kind of sacrifice that we are making to fight this fight. Ms. Yuriku um, Primus, Ms. Um, Simona Brooms, Vice President and President of the Guyana Women Miners Organization, thank you very much for appearing in Plain Talk this evening for the frankness with which you responded to the questions. And I think all Guyanese join you in the struggle you have in combating trafficking in persons. Operators and viewers, thank you. Good night. See you next week.